Hi there everyone! Welcome to this week's video where we're going to be discussing Dostoyevsky and Marx on alienation. Now one thing that you might be thinking as we've proceeded through the course so far is that we've covered some interesting questions like you know, whether civil disobedience is ever permissible, whether we can ever lie, what makes things good, and so on. But you might have this feeling, as many people do, that even though these kinds of ethical questions are in a way interesting, that they don't really speak to the sort of most fundamental or central, uh, foundational concern that perhaps you or I have in our own lives. And what I mean by that is that while it's relatively rare that, for example, we're going to be in the kind of situation that Fichte described where we, you know, are on a sinking ship and we're fighting over uh, the one plank and we have to know what we can do, morally speaking, what we can't do, we're much more likely to confront a kind of psychological situation that I'm going to describe as alienation. In general, philosophers refer to the term alienation in order to make sense of the feeling that you're not at home in the world. That even though you live your life, that in some deep way, your life is not your own. And Usually, alienation comes to describe feelings of distance and disavowal that we feel towards our lives and everyday experiences. Now, this is a very common sentiment, especially in European societies since uh, the 19th century, for reasons that we will certainly discuss. I'm going to be dating myself a little bit here, but just to give an example of some major movies or media franchises that have sort of dealt with this theme, uh, you can think about, for example, the movie Office Space, or Fight Club, or The Matrix. All of these various settings sort of describe average everyday life as mundane and, in a way, meaningless. And so the characters, in one way or another, have to act out and break out of the world that was fundamentally unreal that they had been inhabiting up to this point to do something spectacular, unexpected, and perhaps really meaningful. So this idea that we are not at home in the world, and especially that we're not at home in the kind of society that we have now, is a very common sentiment. And even though it's something that ethicists find hard uh, to deal with oftentimes, I mean, what are they going to tell you? That you shouldn't feel that way or something like that, right? The philosophers, nonetheless, have uh, made important ethical reflections on this topic, in particular by trying to diagnose and understand this feeling that we normally feel very intensely, but ultimately think quite little about. And for our subject this week, we're going to be discussing two very different approaches to the topic of alienation. In particular, a psychological approach given by Dostoevsky, and a more economic or political approach given by Marx. So let's begin with Dostoevsky. For this week, I ask you to read Notes from the Underground, also called The Underground Man which is like a series of fictionalized um, reflections on the part of a narrator who's lived underground for the past 40 years, or so he says. He's a quite unreliable narrator. He has much to say about himself and contradicts himself often. So it can be difficult to discern what it is that we're me meant to see in the underground man's character. So we're going to be spending the first half of our video really breaking down the character of the underground man and conveying what Dostoevsky wanted to uh, communicate to his audience through this figure. 
And to begin with, this first little section I have here says that Dostoevsky gives a psychological explanation of alienation. He says that you are alienated by your consciousness of the indifference of the world to your desire. Now, this is going to be uh, a very, very complex idea that we're going to have to break down over the course of the next 10 minutes or so. In general, it's important that the underground man constantly describes himself as sick. And in a way, uh, the underground man describes his sickness as that he's aware, that he's conscious of the way that the world really is. So the underground man is quite misanthropic, has negative feelings about, you know, the majority of human beings and how it is that they uh, go about living their lives. He regularly contrasts himself with what he calls stupid people. To give you a sense of what Dostoevsky means, let's look at this first quote and then give something of a kind of reading of it. So the underground man is sick, and this first quote is a quotation about that sickness. He says, quote, I swear to you, gentlemen, that to be conscious is a sickness, a real, thorough sickness. So, in other words, the underground man is claiming that everyday people are stupid in the sense that they are not conscious of the indifference of the world to their purposes. So, uh, you know, um, one of the examples of someone who is stupid that uh, the underground man gives is someone who, uh, you know, is sort of battle hungry, like ready to go to war for his nation, and so on. What makes the underground man different from him is that the underground man realizes, in a certain way, the futility of the entire enterprise. So, you know, yeah, you can work hard to achieve your purposes over the course of your life, whatever that is, whether that's defending your country, or raising a family, or having a successful career, or what have you. But if you're conscious in the way that the underground man is conscious, then eventually you will ask the question, all of this for what, right? What, what is the purpose? Am I really achieving my ultimate goal in so far as I'm achieving these relatively minor purposes? What difference does it make in the grand scheme of things? Stupid people on the underground man's account never ask this question. And so they never run into a kind of motivational problem. They're able to just keep plucking along, as it were, without this kind of startling realization that everything in the world might be uh, totally without purpose. So the underground man is useful to no one and, uh, you know, is not able to hold down a steady job anymore or, you know, accomplish any sort of great things uh, or anything like that, in part because he faces a motivational problem due to seeing the futility of all human action and endeavors. Now, you might be wondering, well, okay, Dostoevsky, or underground man, but it doesn't seem like all of my actions are futile, right? So in what sense do you mean to defend the idea that life is fundamentally meaningless and purposelessness, uh, purposeless if it seems like the stupid person really accomplishes their purpose? This is where the specificity of the 19th century is very important. The underground man's argument is based on what he calls natural science and arithmetic. From the underground man's perspective, natural science and arithmetic reveal necessary truths about the world. There's no point in arguing that 2 plus 2 isn't 4, because it clearly is. 
And in the same way that the laws of arithmetic are unchanging, unbending, it doesn't matter how much you wish that the answer was different, so too natural science is also necessary because natural science just is the application of mathematics to the natural world. So on uh, the underground man's account, everything in the world is necessary in the same way that geometry is necessary. So human freedom, free will, and so on, is basically, on his view, an illusion. Or at least, it's an illusion from the scientific standpoint. This is where we get into the second quotation here. Here the underground man says, quote, My God, but what do I care about the laws of nature in arithmetic if they are not to my liking? So in other words, when you discover that the world is governed by natural scientific laws that are absolutely necessary, you realize that you don't have the ability to change anything substantial or fundamental about the way that the world really is. You know, maybe you can uh, have a great career or a great family or whatever, but it will always turn out that the world is indifferent to your purposes. The underground man often compares the world to a stone wall, right? It doesn't matter how hard you bang or, you know, how much effort you put into tackling the wall. It is fundamentally immovable. So in other words, the underground man is trying to say that if everyone knew about the way that the world really is, namely necessary and completely indifferent to my purposes, then you would realize that all human actions are predetermined and futile. The underground man even describes this elaborate situation where we're able to perform mathematical calculations and predict human behavior, which in certain contexts, natural and social scientists are able to do that. For example, in crowd dynamics and so on. And so this is the sense in which uh, the underground man is not at home in the world. The natural scientific vision of the 19th century produced an image of the universe that was like almost a machine or a wind-up clock or, you know, a device, right? It has a predetermined pathway, it moves along its path, the world is understandable, predictable by the means of natural science, but human beings act against this order, right? In a way, just out of sheer pride and arrogance, right? And so in a way, what the underground man is saying is that all human beings, if they could become aware of the situation that they are in, would feel and act just as the underground man does. Let's go to our last Dostoevsky quote. Here the underground man says, You see, reason, gentlemen, is a fine thing that is unquestionable. But reason is only reason and satisfies only men's reasoning capacity while wanting Dostoevsky other other places uses the word desire is a manifestation of the whole life so we come to know that the world is governed by uh, immovable natural scientific laws and there's a part of us the rational part of us that's genuinely satisfied by that but there's another part of us that Dostoevsky calls our desire that wants to preserve our individuality. We don't want to think that we're just the result of natural processes. And so our desire is not in any way amenable to the natural scientific perspective. And we will choose the irrational and we will choose the painful and we will choose suffering just so as to spite, uh, you know, the natural scientific vision. And that is how the underground man sees himself. 
It's an important feature of Dostoevsky's account that he's describing, in a way, a psychological phenomena. Anyone at any period of history that had the sort of natural scientific knowledge that Dostoevsky had would reach, he thinks, the same conclusions. And perhaps he would cite, uh, you know, Buddhist philosophies in India and uh, in other places in East Asia as examples of people that realize, you know, that essentially the world is governed by a causal sequence. And if that's true, then I played no substantial part within it. Now, as we turn to our second figure for this week's video, we're going to look at a very different perspective on alienation, which comes from Karl Marx. In here, Marx gives a political slash economic explanation of alienation, that we are alienated because of the class structure of capitalist society. Before I begin, I always get some amount of worries uh, from students when I teach Marx that my intention is like to indoctrinate you and turn you into a communist or whatever. Uh, that's not my intention. In fact, very many uh, liberal and conservative political philosophers have turned to Marx, and in particular, Marx's account of alienation and even have tried to give, you know, capital, various non-communist approaches, such as capitalist or conservative, uh, etc., readings of these problems, right? So we don't need to agree with Marx at all, right? We're reading Marx alongside someone else already who disagrees with him. Um, and so, you know, that's not my intention. My purpose is that we, as philosophical uh, investigators, use some of Marx's ideas in order to come to a better understanding of our own situation. So feel free to take what works and toss what doesn't, both in Marx and in every single other uh, figure that we end up reading. Now, that being said, you've likely heard a lot more about Marx than many of the other figures that we've read so far. So I would encourage you to think about your brain like a giant Etch-a-Sketch and shake it, right? There's a lot of things that sort of is in the air about Marx. Some of them are true, some of them are false. But for our purposes, we're really focused on specifically this work on alienation th that we're reading together. Now, in general, Dostoevsky's account was that alienation was particularly prominent in the 19th century because we had the 19th century scientific worldview. Marx is going to give a different but related kind of explanation for why these descriptions of alienation are so prominent starting in the 19th century. Marx's account is that the 19th century really uh, uh, amounted to the birth of capitalist society and that capitalistic societies which we'll describe in more detail below, uh, are the source of alienation. So Marx's objective, in a way, is to describe economic systems in terms of how they set up relations of economic production, class relations. And throughout, uh, you know, our uh, analysis of Marx today, I'm going to point out the difference between a feudal society, so economic system roughly characteristic of medieval Europe, especially, um, to can contrast that with capitalistic society, which is normally thought to have emerged basically in the uh, in the short decades before uh, Marx was writing. Marx's idea, his fundamental idea is this, that whereas previous economic systems, such as feudalism, had extremely complex uh, class relationships, there was uh, the aristocracy, there was the king, there was uh, uh, the clergy, there were peasants, 
right? Uh, there were merchant classes. And so there were a whole bunch of different kinds of classes in feudalistic society. But what's distinctive about capitalism is that our entire economic system becomes oriented not around, say, producing uh, enough goods for us you know, to survive and repopulate and reproduce our societal situation on a year-by-year -year basis and perhaps grow, but instead our entire economic system is uh, organized around the pursuit of profit. So in other words, what was previously really, really complex economic class relationships become uh, a simplified into uh, uh, merely two classes. Marx says, quote, the whole of society must fall apart into the two classes, the property owners and the propertyless workers. Important clarification here is that Marx is not talking about private property, right? He's not saying that you are a property owner, for example, if you have a toothbrush or something like that. Instead, what Marx is saying is that property owners are those who own the means of production. So the ways that we sustain our economic lives. So in Marx's time, these were uh, factory owners. In our time, they're CEOs. And the propertyless workers, Marx thinks of as just people who have to sell their labor on a marketplace in order to survive. Marx thinks that it's this situation, the reduction of economic life into the pursuit of profit, that is ultimately the source of alienation. And if we really want to track down where alienation enters to the economic system, what we need to look at is the production process. So Marx is going to look at uh, the production of commodities, which are just goods and services that you sell on a market for a profit. So uh, we'll move on to the second quote and then we'll do some explanation. Marx comments that in capitalist societies, the object which the labor produces, labor's products, confronts it as something alien as a power independent of the producer. So, for example, uh, I have been in a situation at many points in my life where I sell my labor on a market um, for a wage, right? I've been a cashier at Walmart. I've been a pizza delivery person at Domino's. I've worked at a liquor store and so on. And in these situations, it's not like the product of my labor is something that I keep or is even really valuable to me. When I go in, for example, uh, to be a delivery driver at Domino's and you end up making pizzas for 40 minutes out of the hour, the product of your labor, the pizza, right? It's not something that you own. Right? What you're getting out of the relationship is a paycheck, a wage, right? And so your relationship to your work is like, well, it doesn't matter. I could be making pizzas, I could be back at Walmart, I could be selling liquor, you know. As the worker, you are in a way forced to be indifferent towards the product of your labor. Compare this with what society looked like in feudal societies. In feudal societies, your profession would usually be dictated by your family. So, for example, if you're a cobbler, if you're someone who uh, makes shoes, then you probably came from a family of cobblers. And your family has passed down techniques over the course of great, very many generations. 
and you knew that you were going to be a cobbler your entire life, and you had a specific relationship to the shoes that you, as a particular person, produced. In a capitalist economic system, where the laborers don't have access to their means of production, so uh, you know their ability to cobble together shoes, and instead they do it for a corporation or what have you, then they lose the particular relationship that they have to the product of their labor. When I worked at Domino's, I was interested, of course, in trying to be a good worker or whatever, but I had no special relationship to Domino's pizza. It was just another thing that I had to make in order to make ends meet. And moreover, I didn't learn anything on that job. I didn't get closer to pizza or something like that, for example. Why? Well, because in a capitalist economic system, you're not making stuff from scratch. You're getting a frozen pizza out of a freezer. You're doing a standardized process that involves using the machinery that is owned, not by you, but by Domino's. And at the end of it, I didn't know how to make a pizza. I knew how to manipulate the Domino's equipment such that it could make a pizza for me. So in other words, I had no relationship to Domino's Pizza. I had no relationship to the product. I, it was in a source of pride for me that I made this particular pizza. Anyone could have made it, right? That's the nature of the production process at Domino's. Exactly so that people can just go in and out. <coughs> Excuse me in and out of the economic process and that workers can be relatively fluid and, uh, you know, move from one employer to the next as the demands of capital uh, dictate. So in other words, what Marx is trying to describe is that the capitalist economic system alienates the worker from the product of the worker's labor. Now, this thing that I spend the vast majority of my life doing, I strangely have no relationship to it. I don't care about it. It doesn't matter to me. It's not an indication of myself at all. And Marx begins to expand his account. He says, you are alienated from the product of your labor. You're also alienated from the labor process. You don't dictate your own hours. And even in, you know, uh, the kind of like Uber, DoorDash, et cetera, jobs where you now increasingly are able to uh, determine your own hours, you are constrained constantly by the people who own the means of production, the people who own DoorDash or Uber Eats or, you know, whatever, that have the algorithm that determines whether you'll get, uh, you know, jobs and how many you will get. So you lose control over both the product of your labor, but also the how of how you produce uh, things economically. And Marx thinks that when you lose your relationship to this, you lose your relationship to what Marx calls our species being. So in other words, we lose our humanity because our humanity itself is that we are socially laboring animals. We're meant to work together and we're meant to do so under, uh, con uh, 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 excuse me, under circumstances that we have some degree of control over. And once we lose our relationship to humanity, once we no longer can recognize one another as fellow socially laboring animals, then we can only view one another as competition for the very limited economic resources that are available to us. And that's Marx's account of alienation. For him, ultimately, alienation is an economic matter, and it's one where if you analyze economic systems, you'll come to understand it in more depth. 
Do you agree with Dostoevsky's more psychologically inclined view, or do you lean more towards Marx's economic and political view, or some other view of alienation? I'm very interested to hear what it is that you have to say, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.